Naomi Reskies, welcome to uh, this series of The Philosopher, uh, as Anthony said, on knowledge and authority. And let's jump straight into your book, White Trust Science. This must be maybe the longest um, book tour that you've ever done. <laughs> this book was originally published in 2019, uh, before the coronavirus pandemic. And, you know, the question, why trust science, of course, became uh, a lot more urgent very quickly. So do you think that the experience of going through this pandemic has given people more reasons to trust science than they had before? Or has it contributed to the phenomenon of mistrust in experts and scientists, both because maybe, you know, in the beginning of the pandemic, many errors were made, scientists made uh, claims that were later shown to be false, like there was no asymptomatic transmission of the virus, or uh, there wasn't any airborne transmission. But also for another reason, which you point out in your book, which is that science and politics became quite entangled through this whole year. And since politics is often used as a justification for policies during during this past year, it was policies that divided people very much so along partisan lines, especially in places like, like the US. So what do you think this year's experience has been in terms of trust in science? Uh, well, I think the short answer is all of the above. Um, you know, the answer to your question is yes. Uh, so I think we've seen that science has, in fact, given us very substantial reason uh, to for trust this year. If we think about what the molecular biologists and immunologists and geneticists did in creating not just one, but multiple highly effective viruses, uh, we see that science performed incredibly well in this pandemic. And then in fact, the scientific community gave us exactly what we expect from them, which is to say, if we think about why, why do countries like the United States and the United Kingdom fund science? It's because we have a social contract that goes back more or less to World War II, in which the promise was that if we supported basic scientific research, it would pay us back through useful innovation, technology, medicine, and the like. And that's exactly what happened this year. Uh, scientists were able to draw on recent advances in genetics, particularly the understanding of messenger RNA, and use that to create not one, not two, but you know now, well, I, I don't want to. I want to be careful, but multiple, several, yeah. several highly effective, highly, highly effective uh, viruses, and many of us now vaccines, not viruses. Let's not sorry. feed the, sorry, <laughs> the sorry, conspiracy sorry, theories. Vaccines. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you for that question. Vaccines. And many of us uh, are now fortunate enough to have been vaccinated and are beginning to get our lives back. So I think that as a factual matter shows us that science has given us a lot of reasons to trust it. That said, as you pointed out, there's also been tremendous politicization of the issue. And the politicization has followed exactly the same patterns as what I tracked in my work with Eric Conway in our book, Merchants of Doubt, in terms of the politicization of climate science. And that mm -hmm. conservatives, uh, people on the right, people who distrust government, uh, people who believe in, quote, limited government, although that's a very problematic phrase, but you know what, what we mean by it, or maybe we don't know what we mean by it, but we've heard it. Um, those people, both in the United States and the United Kingdom, and in some other places too, really lined up systematically against accepting the advice of experts, accepting meaningful government action, and particularly against taking the steps that we needed to take, which were going to require compromises to individual liberty and freedom in order to protect the health and safety of us all. And mm -hmm. so that has played a giant role in the United States. And if you look at the poll data, you know, it's a little too soon to know for sure, but we have very compelling poll data that suggests uh, that we are seeing a very, very strong political polarization on this issue. And among those people in the United States who have said that they have no intention of getting vaccinated, not now, not ever, um, they are very disproportionately white Republican men. Right, yeah. So despite obviously the, the kind of polarization around this topic, politicians in many countries, including here in the UK, who previously had sort of fed into this, you know, uh, skepticism towards experts, we had politicians in the UK who said people had enough uh, of listening to experts, we're tired of listening to experts. They changed their tune, and of course, they you know they they seek they 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 seek the advice of experts. And the new slogan became "We're following the science" rather than <laughs> "Who cares about the science?" But a question that obviously relates to your book as well is: Is it right to ever talk about science um, 
as a sort of one unified thing? Is there such a thing as science or are there only sciences, as it were, like epidemiology or physics or experimental psychology that don't yeah. really have much in common? Yeah, that's a great question. Of course, I came of age where that was a big question in the field of history and philosophy of science, particularly because, you know, coming out of the era of positivism, there was a dream of, you know, the dream of unified science. Mm -hmm. And my own thesis advisor liked to point out that Thomas Kuhn's famous structure of scientific revolution was published uh, as part of the series on unified science. And yet one of the things he did was to help disunify <laughs> our picture of science. So I think this is a little bit of a tricky one. I think all of us who work in this field understand that the methods of the diverse sciences are diverse. And that's why one of the central arguments of the book is that there is no such thing as the singular scientific method. The whole first chapter of the book makes that argument. But at the same time, I think from a cultural standpoint, we have a notion of science as an enterprise. And I think we can see strong continuities between the various sciences at any given time and also across time in the various sciences. So I think the category of science is still useful, but it's a bit like the category of religion or government or the state. You know, any big analytical category like that, of course, is going to break down a bit when you begin to look at it in detail. So we all know that there are very significant differences between uh, Roman Catholicism and you know Vietnamese Buddhism, but yet we still have a notion that there is this thing that we can call religion, and that that category is still a useful one even while we recognize the diversity of activities that may take place within that category. Yeah, so as you say, this this question obviously relates to the first uh, chapter of your book, the question of demarcation of science. What is what is that thing called science to reference a kind of classic uh, book by Alan Chalmers and on the philosophy of science. So in your book, you go through the kind of standard ways of trying to define science by attempting to articulate what the scientific method is like what is that thing that makes science so special and that all sciences have in common um and in your book you argue that none of the proposed methods essentially manage to capture all of what we call science can you give us maybe at least one example of a classic way of thinking about science and why that ends up not fitting the bill mm -hmm. well one obvious example that's close to my own heart is the the notion of the hypothetical deductive method sometimes also referred to as the experimental method so if people have been taught in school that there is a scientific method, typically this is what they're taught. And it's the idea that scientists develop a hypothesis, then they deduce what the logical consequences of that hypothesis would be. And then they attempt to test that, test those deductions, find out if those deductions uh, obtain in the world, either through direct observation of the natural world or through experiments. Now, my argument is the hypothetical deductive method is fine. And some scientists do use it, but lots don't. Mm -hmm. And it's not just that the better scientists use it and the worst scientists don't know. Some of the greatest science in the history of science did not fit that. And the most obvious example is Charles Darwin. Uh, we all, mm -hmm. anyone who's read uh, the many good biographies of Darwin knows that when Darwin went on the voyage of the Beagle, he was not testing a hypothesis. He really didn't know what he was doing. He's really actually a rather confused young man, but he knew that he liked being outdoors. He knew he was very taken by what in those days would be called natural historical questions. Um, he had read Charles Lyell and he was very influenced by Lyell's way of thinking about the world, which was a highly inductive, bottom-up observational way of approaching problems. Uh, and he knew, knew in his heart that he did not wanna be a doctor. And so, you know, he goes out into the world and he collects huge amounts of information, uh, does tremendous observational work, but it's a long time. It takes Darwin a really long time um, before he's able to articulate that as a coherent theory, uh, which is, you know, what we, what we know of his work today. So that's just one example of how you can do great science that's not hypothetical deductive. And there's lots of other examples, but that's my favorite because nobody's gonna argue with me that Darwin wasn't a good scientist. Well, Karl Popper <laughs> died, but you know, he didn't really, that didn't really succeed for him. Yes, and Popper is another one of those examples that you go through in your book, and one that, as you say, a lot of scientists still to this day uh, sort of cling on that science. What, what science tries to do is falsify theories uh, via testing them against experience. But as you as you explain, that's also uh, doesn't really fit the bill of many uh, many of the things that scientists do. Uh, 
So once we abandon this idea that, you know, what makes science science is a particular method that it follows. And you remind us in the book of uh, the fire ambient uh, reply that if, you know, if he was pressed to give an answer of what the method of science was, he would have to say anything goes, right? So, you know, there's just so many things that scientists try and do uh, when they're doing science. But so once we leave that behind us, the idea that there is a special method, what we have left is this kind of institutional definition of science. You know, science is what scientists do. And especially in relation to the question of trust, isn't there a danger there of people finding the response a little bit unsatisfying? Don't people want to know, well, what is it that scientists do that makes it, makes their products, as it were, so special? Sure. Well, for one thing I want to say, I think it is a little unsatisfying in a way. I think anybody who went into this field, you know, when I did 30 years ago, we wanted there to be a clean answer, right? The whole project of positivism, I mean, I'm very sympathetic to the logical positivists because I'm sympathetic mm -hmm. with what they were trying to do, which was to say, well, what is it? You know, we feel that science is very effective and powerful. We see the way it does produce knowledge that we can use in the world. So what is it that these people are doing? So the project of trying to get at that is one for which I have great sympathy. But life doesn't always give you what you want. And sometimes life is tough. And you know, you Brits have the expression hard cheese. The first time I heard that expression, I didn't know what it meant. You know, but now it's like, yeah, sometimes it's just hard cheese. And so we have to grapple with the complicated reality, even if it's difficult, and even if it's sometimes hard to explain. And this is something that I've been saying a lot in interviews recently, because science is hard. It's not always as hard mm -hmm. as some scientists make it out to be. I think sometimes scientists overstate how complicated and difficult what they do is, uh, but it is hard and it's not always easy to explain. And so part of the point of this book was to say, okay, I'm up for this, right? It doesn't have to be simplistic. I don't have to be able to reduce it to a word like falsification or, or a slogan like experimental method. I can take this on as a serious question and respect my readers and hope that they are willing to stay with me while we answer that question. And so what I come to is sort of twofold. So there isn't a method, scientists do many different things, but there is a practice that they share and that we can identify in these diverse sciences, whether it's physics or field geology or epidemiology or computer modeling of, of, you know, of the climate system. And it's the critical vetting of claims mm -hmm. that the key thing in science is not how you get the idea in the first place, but how that idea is evaluated and the evidence that you can bring to support it. And so the critical vetting of claims in the context of evidence is something that I think we can say is shared across disciplines and we can track back in time so we can see geologists you know, in the 17th century or the 18th century uh, doing something that is recognizably similar, maybe not in all details, but at least in its broad intentions and actions as today. But the other crucial part of it is if we ask the question, well, who is it who does that critical vetting? The answer is, it's not me, right? This is where the whole Popperian falsification breaks down. I don't vet my own claims, other people vet my claims, mm -hmm. my colleagues, my fellow experts in my field. And this is crucial for a number of reasons. First of all, I believe as the feminist philosophers have, I think correctly argued, people like Helen Longino and Miriam Solomon, that objectivity does not inhere in the individual. Science is not objective because I manage to be objective. I mean, I might try to be objective and I think many scientists do try to be objective, mm -hmm. but not always. Some scientists are convinced that their role is to argue for their position, right? But it's not about me personally. I submit my claims to my colleagues and they get to vet it. And I do mm -hmm. that at workshops, I do that at conferences, I do it through publication peer reviewed journals. And my claim only gets accepted as a scientific claim when it's withstood that gauntlet of tough professional criticism. And the other important point about that is, again, who is it who's doing it? It's other experts. And that's where the role of expertise comes in. And that's where I think, you know, the Brexit line about we're sick of experts is, you know, so misguided, both culturally, but also intellectually. It's not about saying, trust me, I'm an expert. It's about saying we have these people who know a lot, who have dedicated their lives to learning about these topics and they're the ones who vet the claims. So if I publish an article in a peer reviewed journal, it means that my colleagues who are experts in this area have said, yeah, that argument makes sense. We think it's probably right. And of course, it's not just the one paper either 
because this is now going on every day, a thousand times a day across the world. And now we develop these bodies of knowledge, bodies of claims supported by bodies of evidence. And that's what science is really all about. And so one of the sort of one of my take homes or my punchlines to say, I'm not asking people to trust individual scientists or individual experts, but I am saying that we have good reason to trust the process that vets claims so that what we finally end up with typically does turn out to be pretty reliable and pretty robust. Mm. I think this is, I mean, I have two thoughts about, about this um, sort of social, as it were, defense of, um, of science. One is a question about whether this is a little bit biased towards contemporary science, science that's happening today, which is a lot more collaborative, social, people are part of research groups, part of labs, no one does research on their own anymore, really. Uh, as far as I'm aware, maybe some theoretical physicists do, but even they tend to have, you know, their conferences and and, and things like that. And one question is like, is this true of, of older science? Is this true of, you know, Newton and Darwin and, and those kinds of people? And yeah. then another... Can I answer that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, and I I've obviously anticipated that question, and I think it is. And again, this is where, you know, when I talk about modern science, or I, I think we can trace these practices back to you know, the early modern period, roughly speaking, the creation of the Royal Academy or the French Academy or the Academy of Del Lince in Italy. Um, so setting aside the Greeks, right, you know, who had a different social model, I think we can see these same kinds of processes. And I think if you think about why were these academies even created and what did they do when people got together at the Royal Society or the French Academy, they presented their work and they subjected it to questioning and criticism. The scale was different than today, but the kinds of processes were similar. So if you read the proceedings of the, say the philosophical proceedings, the Royal Society, one of the things you see is that often they publish the transcripts of the discussions hmm. and people are asking questions and right. people are saying, well, what about this? And what about that? And sometimes people ask for more evidence. And some people say, well, you know, uh, Professor Lyle has pre presented a very interesting speculative hypothesis, but we'll need more evidence before we, <laughs> decide if this is correct. So you, you see this kind of critical vetting taking place. The other thing we know from history, and again, my colleague Janet Brown's wonderful biography of Darwin is very illuminating on this point. So Darwin was a kind of isolationist. You know, he practiced physical distancing. He liked to be left alone, but he has this enormous correspondence with scientists around the globe. And they're asking him questions and he's asking them questions. And when he's not certain about something he thinks, he writes to people and says, well, you know, do you have any evidence about this? What do you know from, you know, the barnacles in South America? And so he's involved in a community of critical vetting of claims, even if it's, it's, it's the 19th century version of a virtual community, it's being done very much through correspondence. And that I've seen in my own work in the 20th century, in the early 20th century, geologists did that as well. I mean, people were not as mobile as they are today. Um, it was harder to travel. Some of the geologists I wrote about in my first book they took one big trip to South Africa to see the key rocks there that were relevant to continental drift. And that was an event of a lifetime, but they're corresponding with people and they're talking to people in different ways through letters and correspondence. So I think we can see this kind of critical vetting. The exact forms have changed over time, particularly as technology has changed, but the concept, the idea, I think we actually can track back uh, into the 19th, 18th, and even the 17th centuries. The other thought, I mean, this is less of a question, just a sort of comment on it, is that it's very counterintuitive, this position, because it's some, in some ways it makes uh, what's important about science not, you know, the fact that Darwin did put forward the theory or that Newton put forward the, that theory or Einstein put forward his theory of relativity, but the sort of the, the work that the rest of the scientific community did to accept those theories as, as valid. And I guess that's just against our cultural sort of stereotype of the kind of scientist genius that puts forward their theory and you know that's the kind of right and I of think, it. right I think my work is an attempt to push back against the great scientist the great mm. man you know the great white European man <laughs> model of science but not in a debunking way but in a both end way because I have enormous respect for Darwin and Lyle and Newton and Galileo I mean these were great thinkers and their work obviously is important and they had insights that were crucial to the development of scientific knowledge. But what I'm arguing is it's not enough. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to have the idea, no matter how good the idea is, it's gotta be vetted by other people. And all of these great men and women of science 
were part of these processes. One more example I'll just start is Kepler. Now Kepler was a famously kind of crazy person, right? And and uh, Galileo, you know, didn't want to be too closely associated with some of Kepler's ideas that he thought were a little off base. But there's this rich correspondence, right? And Kepler is writing to people and he wants to know what they think. He's not just saying, you know, I've got my great theory about the harmony of the spheres and I'm invoking Plato and it's all great. No, he's putting these ideas out there and he's asking other people to respond and let them know what they think. And I think that's just fascinating, right? So even someone like Kepler or Darwin, who we might think of as being, you know, very alone, very solitary, working by themselves, they're still looking for this feedback from their colleagues. Yeah, that's really that's really interesting. And obviously, as a historian of science, that's part of your your job to remind us that you know these uh, stereotypes are are often not true. Um, so let me ask you a question about you know you put forward this uh, social nature of, of science as its strength, its aversion. You say of the wisdom of the crowds only this time is a highly selected crowd with you know PhDs and researchers and highly qualified people. But isn't there, isn't this social aspect of science also potentially a negative, right? So Thomas Kuhn famously in The Structure of Scientific Revolutions argues that most science is what he calls normal science. It's a deeply conservative uh, affair with scientists being socialized into a scientific paradigm that they then are very reluctant to let go of uh, so that they find always you know, ways to excuse its weaknesses, its limitations, always finding uh, explanations other than the fact that their adopted theory might actually be wrong. So isn't science for that reason in danger of becoming um, what we call today, um, uh, you know, fall into groupthink? Um, so isn't that part of the social aspect a negative rather than a positive? Yeah, and yes, I think that to some extent I agree with that. And it's like everything, you know, nothing is unalloyed. Uh, I can this will make a shameless uh, plug for my other book, which um, our host Anthony was kind enough to mention. So this actually just came out. So this is a funny week for me because Why Trust Science is coming out in Britain this week. So it's the right time to be doing that. But in the United States, this book just came out. And one of the arguments of my magnum opus is about alloys. That the idea of pure knowledge is again, it's a kind of abstract idea. It doesn't really exist in reality. In reality, everything we do is alloyed and everything we do involves trade-offs. And that's as true in epistemology as it is in you know, a marriage, let's say, right? So I think the social character of science is complicated. And I think there are trade-offs, but I but I also think that it's essential because if if I'm right about the critical vetting of claim, and I say I, but I mean I'm drawing on the work of a lot of other colleagues who I hope I have cited copiously in the book, because I was really thinking of this book as a kind of attempt to integrate work that a lot of people had done over the last 30 years. Um, there is no reliable scientific knowledge without the vetting of claims. And I can't be the one to vet my own claims. Someone else has to do that. So it's really an argument that the social character of science is essential to the critical vetting, which is what yields claims that we think will stand up to scrutiny. And so part of the argument in the book is an argument against the sort of science wars arguments that you know we had back in the 90s, where a lot of scientists took offense at the sociologists in, of science who were saying, look at the social structure of science. Um, and the scientists were offended and they thought that that meant that the sociologists were claiming that science was bogus or that it was only groupthink or that it was just merely a social construction and therefore bore no reality. And what I wanted to say is, wait, stop. You got this all wrong. You can flip this on its head and make the opposite argument that the social character of science is its strength because we're not relying on the wisdom or the good character you know, or the capacity to suppress your emotions of an individual. No, it's like a, a scientist can be as biased as he wants. I mean, this is where I think Popper, you know, Popper said a lot of things that were smart and really thoughtful, but he said some things that were um, really idiotic. <laughs> and so one of the idiotic things Popper said was to suggest that scientists themselves should be trying to refute their own theories, right? Nobody does that, right? <laughs> scientists go to bat for their theories because they believe in them and that's fine. Because if I go back to bat for my theory, you can say, well, hold on, Naomi, you know, you've missed this or you've missed that. So the social character of science is crucial for us, for our understanding why scientific claims are likely to hold up because they've already gone through this critical scrutiny. Now that said, obviously any social process runs the risk of groupthink. 
And certainly we have examples of that in the history of science. And I think my first book on continental drift, you could argue that American scientists fell into a kind of group think about continental drift theory. But I'd say a couple of things. I don't think it's any worse in science than in other walks of life. Mm -hmm. And arguably it's better because science encourages the critical element. And so, you know, if you think about a business community, and I had the experience actually of experiencing group think early in my career in a private sector situation, and it was incredibly painful and difficult. Uh, in fact, it's, I think, partly why I ended up becoming a historian of science, because I had this experience and I felt like I couldn't say anything because I was the low woman geologist on the totem pole and my boss was the boss. And so the other junior geologist and I would have these secret conversations out in the core farm, you know, whispering because we didn't know what to do. Whereas in academic life, you know what to do. You present a paper at a conference. And if the person you're going up against is really famous, well, then maybe you enlist some other people or you enlist your thesis advisor. Science has mechanisms built-in mechanisms to address the risk of groupthink. So it's not to say it doesn't sometimes happen. Yes, it absolutely does. But I actually think it happens less in science than many other areas of human endeavor. So you, you hinted at two things there, which I, I want to ask you about. One is what effect did this uh, sort of constructivist postmodern thinking about science, uh, people like Bruno Latour and, and, and other sort of postmodern thinkers, do you think they played a role in the end to, you know, the kind of experience that we have now of people mistrusting science or thinking it's all just, you know, perspectives on, on the world and, you know, no one perspective is better than the other and so on? Or is that discussion too academic to remove to have really had an impact on, you know, ordinary people and how they think about science? Um, I know some of those... Yeah you know, arguments were weaponized, for example, by, by some of the people that you call merchants of doubt, but. Right. Um, well, this is a very difficult question because of course it's really hard work to really figure out why people think the things they think, right? And I, I think mm -hmm. we need to do a lot more research to try to better understand, you know, say people who are uh, refusing vaccinations, what's really behind that. And it's difficult work to do. It requires really sophisticated ethnography or social psychology, because often people will give you an answer that they consider socially acceptable, and it still doesn't really tell us why they really think those things. But I think that the evidence we have suggests that, um, the way I've put it before, and I can say this because I consider Bruno a friend, that Bruno has, you know, taken too much blame or too much credit, depending on how you want to look at it, for this. I mean, I think we have very little evidence that people who reject vaccines or don't believe in climate change are reading you know, Bruno Latour, much less Derrida. I remember most of this didn't actually come out of science studies originally. This came out of literary theory, right? Social constructionism. And even before that, it comes out of a particular branch of conservative sociology, um, which most people have completely forgotten about if they ever even knew. So this whole cultural discussion long predates science studies. I mean, you could argue it goes back to, you know, Heisenberg uncertainty principle. I mean, there's a big cultural discussion about relativity theory and whether physical relativity translates into cultural moral relativity. So this is a big cultural argument that's been going on for a hundred years. Very, very difficult to know how backdrop cultural trends and arguments influence individual people's thinking. But all of the work we've done has suggested that it's not, or that it's minor, it's, that it's not, it's not the elephant in the room. And so this, of course, brings me to my book, Merchants of Doubt, that I wrote with Eric Conway that we published in 2010. I mean, we were trying to understand in that book the phenomenon of climate change denial. And what we found was overwhelming evidence that these people were motivated by market fundamentalism, by the defense of what they understood to be, quote, free market capitalism, and their belief in the link between free market capitalism and freedom, political and cultural freedom. And mm -hmm. this is a, a trend, a way of thinking that you can find in a huge amount of conservative thinking, both in the United States and in Europe. And, and you can see it re-expressed in the sort of uh, resurgent neoliberalism of the 1990s onward. And if you look at who's funding this work, what kind of arguments they're making and who they're reaching out to, it has nothing to do with academic arguments about the social construction of reality. So I think that a lot of the arguments about academic life, um, you know, it, it's nice to think that our arguments are so influential, but honestly, I, I really think that's 
the least of it. Now, I don't want to say it doesn't play some role. I mean, this larger cultural backdrop maybe in a way conditions people to be more receptive to the arguments. But again, the, the, the central anti-climate change argument in the United States is not, oh, there's no reality. That's not what the emergence of data is saying or that reality is socially constructed. No, they're saying, we just don't know, right? They're exploiting uncertainty to make people doubt scientific findings. And what we showed in our book was where do they get that from? They don't get that from Bruno Latour or, or Paul Deman or Jacques Derrida. They get it from the tobacco industry. Right, yeah. And, and the use of sort of very bad pessimistic induction arguments about how right. you know, science was wrong in the past and therefore maybe it's wrong in the in the present. Right, which is a really idiotic use of the pessimistic meta-induction, right. And, and we could have that conversation and it's actually kind of a fun one to have intellectually. <laughs> uh, and that was actually partly why in Why Trust Science I do take on the question of eugenics because that's a favored example by the um, merchants of Dow to say, well, scientists were wrong about eugenics, so why should we believe them now? Well, obviously that's illogical on lots of levels, but it, I think it does behoove us to say, okay, well, let's look at eugenics, right? And what do we find when we actually look at that example? Mm. Another thing you, you hinted at, and obviously your, your explanation of what the merchants of doubt are doing is exactly being motivated by values and ideas and sometimes even money to you know, put forward their theories. But sometimes the argument is made in the opposite direction, right? That science actually isn't objective, politically neutral, only about facts, but that science is also value laden, that values also play a role in, in science. And you know, scientists, as you said, are also just humans. They have their biases, they have their preferences, they have values. So how can we think of the role of values in, in science without it becoming um, a sort of negative, without, without it be becoming something that erodes people's trust in science? Mm -hmm. Again, well, this is another example where, you know, the right answer is going to be a little bit complicated and it's not just going to be a slogan. But um, I think two things. One is that I don't think it ever works to give a false argument in defense of a good value, right? So we may, if we believe in the value of science and we think that science does often give us reliable information and that it's a generally useful way of exploring the world, might not be the only useful way, but it's certainly one extremely important useful way. It doesn't work in my opinion to present a false vision of science because then when people see the truth, they can say, aha, look. And I think we saw that particularly in the United Kingdom with the incident that some people like to call climate gate, although I think that's an extremely uh, mm. unfortunate moniker. But in that example, scientists emails were stolen. So first of all, let's get this clear. Who's the criminal here? The person who stole, who hacked into what was supposed to be a secure uh, computer center and stole emails. But what did those emails show? They showed the people that they were human beings, that they were frustrated, that they didn't know how to respond to what they were facing. And you know they weren't trained as scientists to know how to respond to disinformation. And so a couple of them, you know, in what they thought were private conversations said some things that, you know, didn't seem all that admirable. Okay, so what's the reality there? Scientists are human beings with feet of clay. Like to me, that hardly seemed like a front page story, but there were a lot of journalists, particularly in the United Kingdom, who were like, it was like a schadenfreude, a moment. Aha, see, the gods of science are actually petty, yeah. you know, and they're actually, you know, they get annoyed, they get irritated. Well, if you've set them up as gods, then you've set them up for a fall. But if you set them up as human beings who are part of a, an enterprise, in which people are working together to figure out the truth about the natural world, or I should say truths about the natural world, then you know those emails would have had much less, if any, impact at all, right? For me, they were like, oh yeah, it's a little too bad that you know so-and-so mm. said that, but okay, whatever. Um, so, so this is one part of why I think it's so important for us to have a realistic sense of what science is and isn't. But the other thing, and this is a big part of the argument of the book is about diversity. So if we take the idea that the reason why we can trust science is because scientists have processes for critical scrutiny of claim and that those processes are tough, they're hard, that lots of things don't make it through the sieve of peer review and critical scrutiny, um, and that scientists are conservative, like the demands, the expectation for how much evidence we need to change our mind is very, very high. So that means that if we actually do change our minds, there's a good chance we had really good reason for, for why we did that. So these are all reasons to have 
confidence that science probably is actually producing reliable knowledge. But there's a giant but in that. And the history of science, and particularly stories such as the, the history of eugenics, really highlight this. It's not going to work if everybody is looking at the problem from the same perspective. Mm. And particularly if everyone has the same biases. And this is where feminist philosophy of science has been really uh, important for me in terms of thinking through not just questions about feminism, but actually about science itself. And of course, this was Sandra Harding's big argument many years ago that feminist philosophy of science isn't about feminism, it's about science. It's about mm -hmm. how we understand how science operates. So what the feminist philosophers of science like Sandra Harding, Helen Longino, Miriam Solomon and others argued was that, yes, we have values and no, we can't get rid of them even if we try. So what's the problem there? Well, the problem is if we all have the same values, then we're yeah. going to bring the same biases to the table. And then we truly may make some pretty serious epistemological mistakes. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if we can make sure that we're looking at a problem from a lot of different angles, that we're, we're considering it from different value perspectives, then the chances of a really big error are reduced. And so the best way to do that is through diversity. Mm -hmm. That if we have a diverse community, it increases the odds that no one particular value set dominates. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's great, because that was one of the audience questions I was going to ask you, a question by Viraf Mehta, exactly about that, about whether you know the lack of diversity in, in uh, the scientific community in the global north basically produces a lack of diversity in thought, and you know that is something that we need to strive for. Let's go to some audience questions. Another one which... I was also uh, meaning to ask you is uh, whether um, this is from David Sternman and uh, David asks, well, since science is people, what damage is done by experts maybe making uh, public and socially significant claims, which are actually outside of their particular area of expertise? And does this make a mistrust of the credential scientist? Yeah, I think so. And this is something I do talk about in the book. So I think that if we are going to make an argument for the respect of expertise, then it means we have to be really clear about the boundaries of expertise. And it also means that we, whoever we are, also have to respect each other's expertise. Mm -hmm. And I think that some scientists, not all, but some have really been guilty of sort of presenting themselves as, well, I'm a scientist, so therefore I'm an expert on everything. And we see that in the Merchants of Doubt story. I mean, sometimes journalists will ask me, well, how was I supposed to know? I mean, Bill Nuremberg was the you know, head of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. He was a famous scientist. He said, yeah, but he wasn't a climate scientist, right? Mm -hmm. And he certainly wasn't an oncologist. Well, Bill Nuremberg didn't do the tobacco stuff, but let's take someone like Fred Seitz. Fred Seitz was a famous physicist. He was the president of the US National Academy of Sciences. So he's a big deal. <laughs> and you could imagine, you could see why a journalist would think that he would be a credible spokesperson, but then just stop to think for one minute. He's a solid state physicist. Why is he talking about tobacco? Not an oncologist, he's not an epidemiologist. And so yeah. that should have been a red flag. And so I do believe that scientists should play a public role speaking about the things about which we are genuinely expert because we know things that our worlds, our societies can benefit from understanding, but it also means that we have to know when to shut up. So, you know, the flip side of speaking up is also knowing when to shut up. And many scientists are good at that. Probably most are. The vast majority of scientists don't really speak up in public at all. The famous ones aren't very good at doing it. But right, but yeah. we do have these people. And again, I'm sorry to say this, but they do seem to be generally men. And I don't know if that's because only men are overweening in their overconfidence or it's because journalists call up the men or whatever. I mean, I think there's a cultural feedback loop there. We have many journalists have an image of scientific authorities as male, so it's hard for them to get their head around the idea that, you know, women can be equally authoritative, if not more so. But, you know, some of these people have kind of, um, you know, their success, their fame goes to their head, and they think that it's appropriate to comment, you know, on any topic. And that, I think, is very damaging, because, you know, if someone like Richard Dawkins says things that are overtly homophobic, then many people will rightly say, well, well why should we trust him? But then they'll go further and why should we trust scientists when they say things like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Biologists often fall into that trap. Uh, Francis well, Crick also has a, a knack for it. Yeah, I think it's physicists more, but I think it has to do with cultural authority, right? That in different mm. moments, different scientists have cultural authority. So back in the 50s and 60s, 
physicists had enormous cultural authority and we saw many physicists speaking about things that they had very little expertise on yeah. uh, in the area of in the area of genomics we see more biologists becoming famous and so then you know the risk accrues to them that they get yeah better, right? yeah and of course famously stephen hawking dissed you know philosophy all the time and it was obvious to anyone who knew anything about philosophy that he hadn't read anything or wasn't aware of anything that contemporary philosophy did it was all very much linked to kind of prior conceptions of philosophy i know and it's incredibly shocking i mean i had an experience once like that with a very famous physicist who said unbelievably <laughs> ignorant things about the climate system and the whole mm. question of man-made climate change and i finally after seeing there with all my other colleagues looking at me like okay when is the only going to say something i just said to myself you know if i said things about quantum physics that were even half as ignorant as what you've just said about the climate system, you know, you would laugh me out of the room. So why do you think it's okay for you to say these ignorant things about the climate system? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, you're not always in a situation where that's appropriate. Maybe it wasn't even appropriate. Although he did apologize <laughs> to me later. So and he did say he was going to read my book. So you know, well, you know, but good. Yeah. It's, that's reader. a tedious, it's a tedious process to have to go through. So uh, I'll, I'll summarize a question by Christine uh, Kruzelkininki. Sorry, I'm probably mispronouncing that. Um, but it's a question around um, disagreement amongst experts. So, what do we, you know? One of your arguments is that you know eventually science reaches a consensus and it's been, you know, it's gone through many trials and, and a lot of testing by people and challenging by people, but. You know, often, especially in the beginning of something, uh, th th this uh, this question references, for example, the safety of 5G. And uh, I don't know if this is the case, but the claim is that in Scientific American, you know, there were uh, two competing articles, one that says, well, we have no basis to believe 5G is safe. And the other one says, don't fall prey to fears over 5G. So what do we do when the scientific e experts disagree about something and more importantly, something that might be quite pertinent to our everyday life, like something that might actually impact um, impact us. How do we decide who to trust then? Well, first of all, the 5G example is a really good one. I think Scientific American did a good thing by publishing these divergent views and recognizing that there is, in fact, <clears throat> legitimate differences of opinion over this question. <clears throat> Sometimes we really do need to do more research. Sometimes we really don't know the answers to questions. And then we have to be honest about that. And I think honest disagreement um, is something that we should welcome and we should be mm -hmm. proud of. And I think one of the reasons scientists sometimes get into trouble is because they worry that if they air their disagreements publicly, that somehow that will undermine trust in science. I think the evidence is the opposite um, because it gets back to what I said before about being exposed. Because if you deny the disagreement and then it comes out later, you know, it's mm -hmm. like the cover up is worse than the crime. There's nothing wrong with honest disagreement. In fact, it's a good thing. But if you hide it and you make it seem as if it's a bad thing and then it comes out, that's going to cause you difficulties. And we've seen this um, in our work on the IPCC, uh, the work I did with Michael Oppenheimer and Dale Jameson was published in Discerning Experts, uh, which came out in 2018, I think. Um, you know, we came across this. We came across scientists who said, well, we really feel like we have to have a united front. We feel like if we, if we express disagreement, the deniers will use that against us. And my answer was, first of all, well, look, no matter what you do, the deniers are going to use it against you. So you can't allow your science to be structured on what you think, you know, deniers or other inappropriate mm -hmm. people do. You have to do the best science that you're able to do and then defend it as well as you can. And if you generally don't know, well, the world needs to know that, right? Because then that is an argument for more money for research or for adaptive management or for making the best decision we can in the moment. Um, but those are all conversations that we can have. So, so my view is that I, I would never want anyone to think that I believe that consensus is a goal of science. I do not believe that. I believe that consensus is an emergent property. Sometimes we get it. And when we do, that's when we say we know something. When scientists agree, that's when we'll say, when we say something is an established fact, what we're really saying is that the experts agree about it. Right. And that's great when that happens. But when it doesn't happen, we need to be honest. And in the Discerning Experts book, we actually make the proposal that rather than feeling that scientific communities have to always come to some kind of consensus when they're asked a question that has you know, policy or cultural import, if there's genuine disagreement to report it out. And so one model that scientists could consider would be what we call the Supreme Court model. So in the United States, the Supreme Court issues 
um, decisions, mm -hmm. they will tell you it was seven to two, six to three, five to four, um, and they will tell you why. And the dissenters, not always, but typically the dissenters will write dissenting opinions explaining. And those dissenting opinions are incredibly great resources for mm. historians, right? Because we can go back and say, well, well, what was that disagreement about? And what, what did the dissenters say? And I think that scientists should do that too, because you know sometimes the dissenters, the minority might actually be right. And if it's a question of public policy, where we have to make a decision now, we want to keep in mind that there are some big questions that we need to be paying attention to and not just brush them under the rug. Mm. But is that when, uh, I'm going to ask this question again, paraphrasing a number of questions that ask for more about uh, the relationship between politics and science, uh, yeah, and how science can be politicized. So when there are situations like, like this where experts disagree with each other, is it then the final, you know, the final decision of whoever's in charge, whoever happens to be the president or the prime minister at the time. So is that then, you know, a judgment call of someone who isn't really an expert, who's just listened to, you know, the disagreeing experts in the field and then has to make a judgment based on, you know, maybe their values, maybe their politics. Well, yeah, I think it is a judgment, but I don't think that's particularly problematic. I mean, we want our political leaders to have the best information they can on scientific and technical issues. But at the end of the day, political decisions are always political mm -hmm. and they will involve judgments. They always involve trade-offs between say relative risks. You know, Would we rather live with this risk or would we rather live with that risk? In the case of COVID, would we rather live with the risk of some damage to the economy? Or maybe I shouldn't even say live with the risk, die with the risk of you know what we've seen mm -hmm. now here in the United States over half a million deaths, many of which could have been prevented. So political choices are always judgments there are also judgments about competing freedoms, right? Mm -hmm. So, and ultimately many of those, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. Ultimately, many of those choices will be based on values and that's okay. That's what politics is. Science is a component. It's a contributing component into these decision-making processes. And we want the science to be as good as it can be. And we want people to understand the science as well as they can. But science is never going to be dispositive when we have to make political choices. And it's the same with our personal choices too, when you get back to that 5G thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, often we do need to make decisions in our lives in which the technical information is not always clear. And we, and we make those decisions based on our own values. So we might decide not to take a new drug because we think it's too risky. Um, or we, and we might, I mean, you know, one of the things we've seen in the United States is people who say with respect to the vaccine, they want to wait and see. And, you know, I'm sympathetic to that because for many things in life, wait and see is a reasonable choice. The problem in this case, though, is that if you wait and see, your actions can kill other people. And mm -hmm. so this gets into the whole, you know, this gets us into philosophy 101, right? These are basic philosophical questions about how far do our freedoms go and should we have the right, you know, should, does freedom mean that to I have the others, right? yeah. That kill other people, right? Yeah. And I think, you know, we all know that in general, philosophers have said no. <laughs> the answer to the question is no, you don't have the right to do things that kill other people. So, again, that, liberal philosophers, people that, well, you know, like John Stuart Mill, who, you know, valued uh, freedom as, you know, one of the highest values, puts forward that argument. Right. But still says there's it only goes so far, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but of course, that's where you need good technical information. Because if I say, well, if you do that, you know, you could kill my mother. I need to be able to back up that claim. And that's where then the science comes in because it's the science that supports the claim that that action could in fact kill my mother. Mm. Right, uh, moving from politics to a more abstract philosophical question by Ed Gibney. Um, he asks, Naomi, do you have any thoughts about the field of evolutionary epistemology and whether or not that subdiscipline could fit very well with your depiction of science as one that produces findings which gradually and incrementally change over time? Yeah, that's a good question. I really haven't read the evolutionary epistemology literature closely, so I'll take that as a suggestion uh, and probably not comment on it here. Okay. Uh, okay, let's, we've got three minutes, so maybe one final question. Uh, thanks for the great discussion, Joshua Dacri Grantham. Um, oh, sorry, no, I've, I've uh, <laughs> keep coming in. Um, this is actually by Ga K. Lung. So it says, I'm a PhD student working on the ethical issues in natural disaster policy. Do you have any advice 
for moral and political philosophers who are trying to sensitize natural hazard scientists to the ethical issues involved in formulating natural disaster policy? Oh, wow. Well, that's that's a big one, right? Because natural disaster policy is one in which there's a lot, you're, you're talking about risk, right? Mm. There's tremendous uncertainties, right? Because many natural disasters um, are infrequent events. And so you're often talking about steps you might have to take that might cost a lot of money or be fairly inconvenient for people against a risk that you don't really know how likely that risk is or how frequent it will be to affect the community involved. Um, so I think many of the classic issues that philosophers and epistemologists have worked on are highly relevant in that domain. I guess the additional piece that maybe I would say would be important not to neglect that has come to the fore in recent years are the environmental justice aspects. That one of the things we've seen very clearly in the last 20 years is that um, natural disasters are never entirely natural. That the consequences are almost always playing out in a space where the relative risks have been unequally distributed and they've been unequally distributed often because of conscious choices that people have made about how infrastructure was built, where money was spent, um, who lives where in a community. And so all of those elements, all of those conscious choices that people make that put some people more at risk than others are crucial to our understanding of what's going on. And, it, and it's extremely important, I think, that those elements not be neglected. And typically scientists who have worked on risk assessment have not taken those elements seriously. 